joined the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Historic Preservation Committee about three years ago. I had no idea that I would be getting all involved with cemeteries, but I've been fascinated by them my whole life. I'm not sure exactly why, but it led me to raise my hand, and so I ended up being the chairperson for this project. And it became just a wonderful, wonderful experience because of the fact that along with Linda Harvell, I grew up in College Station and my father came here in 1934. So we've been here, my family's been here a very, very long time. Um, the first thing I wanna say is it's very difficult to figure out who to talk to, uh, to, to talk about in a presentation like this because we have almost 4,000 people that are buried in our College Station cemeteries on Texas <coughs> Avenue. Um, how many of you realize that there's more than one cemetery at 2530 Texas Avenue? Um, I did not know that until I got involved with this, and we do have three distinct cemeteries in that location. The first two were the pre-existing old cemeteries that um, there were four acres. Those four acres were donated to the city or sold for $1. And that came at the time that the College Station um, City Council and all the residents were getting interested in a public cemetery. So the original old, old cemetery is the Shiloh Cemetery, which was originally the um, uh, Rector Chapel Cemetery. It's known as Shiloh now. The other one is uh, originally the Washington Chapel Cemetery, and that one became known as the Salem Cemetery. So they are both um, very old. The Shiloh Cemetery is around 151 years old and the Salem Cemetery is at least 126 years old. So those cemeteries are separate and individual and the College Station Cemetery surrounds that property and they are all owned and maintained by the City Parks and Recreation Department, and they do a fantastic job of that. Um, I actually owe them a big thank you because I'm always asking them questions about something. And our cemetery sexton, Ron Schaefer, is also very, very wonderful about dealing with all of my questions. So, the main problem I had was picking out who I should talk about, and so, I want you to know that there's some people I'm more familiar with. I do have a lot of notes, and if you have questions later on, I'll try to answer them. Um, the main thing I was trying to um, concentrate on was the historic early residents of College Station. So with that being said, um, I've already said a few of many historic early residents in the College Station Cemetery. It should be many, many, many because there are so many and we're just gonna cover a few. Um, the first person who, the first adult who was buried in the College Station Cemetery was Luke Patronella. And he tragically died unexpectedly on a vacation in Mexico. But fortunately the city had already arranged to purchase this 32.31 acres of land from the Bariski family. So when Luke Patronella passed away, they brought him back and he is the first adult. He was buried there in June of 1946. Um, he was an incredibly loved human being because he had the first grocery store, Luke's Grocery, and he is the one that for 20 years provided hundreds and hundreds of Easter eggs for both the African-American children and the white children of the community. So when he passed away, uh, his friends uh, got together, they took in donations, and at, at some point, they actually constructed a big slab. It was there, um, it's not there any longer. And um, this plaque was there by this, um, 
it was a big, big slab for the kids to come. They could play tennis, they could play basketball, they could do whatever they wanted to on this big slab. And I was not even aware when I was growing up that it was dedicated to someone. But now um, it is in the College Station Cemetery. This is the entrance fountain and there's a walkway right in behind it that was put in as a memorial for him. So he had to have been a very civic-minded, wonderful man. These are the professors of A&M who really were responsible for getting things together, getting uh, the, the residents of College Station ready to be incorporated. So, I wanted you to see the picture of them. One, one of the things I, again, was really interested in was trying to find pictures so that you all would have images of who I was talking about. John Benny was a math professor, and he was really the instigator of this whole thing, so he was elected by these men to be the first mayor. Unfortunately, he really wasn't able to stay on for too long. So um, I believe Letcher Gabbard was the one who was the mayor pro tem and he served for a while. Um, every one of these gentlemen was very civic minded. They were involved in all kinds of organizations. Um, A&M was actually a, a self-contained little town. And then when A&M needed to start expanding, that was when the professors, they had to move all the homes off of there. And so it's amazing to me what all they accomplished because they got the, the school moved off the campus, which came um, AM Consolidated. And I don't really have time to go through all of the things that they did, but um, Gabbard Park is one of the parks that is in College Station. Um, George Wilcox was a president of the Texas State Teachers Association. He's the second gentleman. And he also, I found out, was the principal of the A&M Consolidated Public School in 1920, which was located on the A&M campus. And I did not know about that. This is what's been so fun for me because I'm aware of a lot of people, but have not been aware of everything that they have done. And so it's, it's really amazing. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Ernest Langford. Um, he was the long-term mayor. And I've often wondered if there was any other mayor in College Station that ever wanted to be there for like 23 or 24 years. <laughs> um, Alva Mitchell, uh, this gentleman right here, um, was the only one that has not been buried in the College Station Cemetery. I believe he's buried in Bryan, but the rest of these gentlemen, I was very impressed at the fact that they, their heart and soul was dedicated to the city of College Station and that's where they're buried now also. These are three of the early memorable mayors. I'm sure there's a lot of memorable mayors, but I wanted to start off with these men. Um, when Professor Benny left office as a mayor, then Colonel Frank Anderson came in for one year, and I had no idea about him until, again, I started researching. And he has a tremendous record as a track coach at Texas A&M uh, from 1922 to 1957, but he also served at um, some point in time as the Commandant of the A&M Corps of Cadets. Um, he was the College Station Mayor from 40 to 42, and during that time he also functioned as the City Manager. So he had quite a lot on his plate. Um, he is also in the Athletic Hall of Fame at A&M. David Andy Anderson, um, well, he's third. Ernest Langford, we've already talked about him for a little bit, but um, he is quite an outstanding man also, and quite the leader of, um, of this group. Hold on just a minute. I can't remember all these details, you all, so I, you'll have to forgive me about that, because every one of these people, as I've already said, are just outstanding human beings. Ernest Langford was class of 1913, with a degree in architectural engineering, and he was a professor at A&M for 42 years. 
as a teacher, a retired teacher, I can really say, wow. Um, when he retired from A&M, he became the official A&M archivist, and he became known as a walking authority on A&M history. He was mayor from 1942 to 1966, and he was chosen Man of the Year in College Station in 1954, and also was listed in Who's Who. So um, it's, I, I walk through and I look at the tombstones for these gentlemen, and I just kind of just go, wow. Um, David Anderson has, uh, Andy Anderson he was known as, there is the Arboretum behind, over by Bee Creek Park and behind the cemetery that is named for Andy Anderson. And he was um, one of the few, really, that was not a member of the a and faculty, but he was employed with the Texas Forest Service. And he not only was a city council member, he was a member of the Planning and Zoning Committee, and then mayor again later on from 1966 to 1971. Um, he is the one that is credited with taking College Station from a small little town to a major city in Central Texas. And the thing that I was most impressed about was he was instrumental in bringing the emergency um, phone number 911 to College Station, and College Station was one of the first cities in Texas to employ this service. So I think that was really cool. No, not that I'm aware of. Um, we just had a, a um, historic... To the in the oh, I'm sorry. She was saying, are the Andersons related? Not that I'm aware of. Um, but we just presented the 108th Historic Preservation Home Plaque um, to the dressers, and Dr. Anderson, who is the son of Frank Anderson, was there, and it was really fun talking to him. and. We're so lucky to have him still in the community. Um, he was actually brought up on the A&M campus in school there, so that was kind of cool. Um, I, I'm, I was in putting this together, trying to find different areas that might be of interest to you all. One of the things is we do have four elected presidents buried in the College Station Cemetery. This is the first three. Frank Bolton uh, was the 16th president of A&M. He has a Bolton Hall is named after him. He was the first head of the A&M Engineering Department in 1909 at 26 years old. By the time he was 37, he was dean of the engineering school. Um, he was president of A&M from 1948 to 1950 and ended up with 46 years of teaching at Texas A&M. That is quite an accomplishment. One of the things that was really interesting to find out about him is that he's credited with the development and maintenance of WTAW radio in 1922. He had the first radio station to broadcast an athletic event. So I thought that was really neat. Again, all of these men that we're talking about are not only teachers or are not only council members. They had so much going on that had to do with the community. In his case, he was also the president of the College Station Chamber of Commerce, and he was affectionately known as the grand old man of A&M. Gib Gilchrist was the next um, president of A&M, and he was also the first chancellor. Um, he was the dean of the School of Engineering. There's a, a building named for him on the A&M campus. He is the one who proposed the airport. So he was really responsible for getting us an airport, and he was the one who suggested the name of Easterwood, who is Jesse L. Easterwood, um, a World War II veteran and war hero. Gib Giltrist was the president of A&M from 1944 to 48, and the city of College Station named a street after him. I live in the College Hills area and all these wonderful streets are around. Texas A&M named the engineering building out uh, for him, 
and he was named in 1962 as the Kiwanis Club's Outstanding Community Leader Award. Marion Thomas Harrington went um, by Tom Harrington, and he was the first chancellor and president of a and And of course, he is the one who brought Earl Rudder to Texas A&M. So that was the thing that he did that was the most outstanding for most of us. Um, Earl Rudder, a lot of people probably don't know that he came from a small West Texas town. He was a coach. He had been a football player. Um, he was the mayor of his town, and his wife was the valedictorian of her little town, and I believe it was Menard, Texas. And I feel so fortunate. Linda and I both went to school with their three daughters. I never knew their two sons, but their three daughters were wonderful people. And they had a wonderful dad. My goodness, this is the man who, who really brought A&M into the forefront. He is the one who, who brought about the name change from Texas A&M College to Texas A&M University. He is the one who really opened the doors for women to come to A&M. And he also was the one who took uh, away the mandatory Corps of Cadets participation. So he came from a small town, but he was a very large person in all respects. Um, he was a brilliant war hero. Um, I can't even tell you all the awards he was given for his war service. But then he came back and he made all these accomplishments and, and did so many great things when he got back. He was a young man. He was a colonel when he came out of the war in 1945. And then he was eventually a, um, made a major general while he was in the reserves. But he, <laughs> he was doing something you know, really well in his hometown and then he was urged to come to Austin and take over a position there, did beautifully there, and that's what brought him to Texas A&M. And my, my husband and I graduated side by side, and we were so excited because we thought we were going to get our diploma from Earl Rudder, and he actually passed away in March of 1970, and we graduated in May. So I was sad about that, but um, all of his medals and everything are so deserved. And um, I know there's a reason that there's Rudder Tower and there's a, a statue to him. And there's even a portion of our freeway around College Station Bryan named after him. Eli Whiteley was our Medal of Honor winner from College Station. Uh, he, his family actually lived across the street from mine. Um, I never met him, I was sorry to say, but um, he came back to a and He finished his degree and went on and got his PhD from here. And he did a lot of um, research in agronomy and soil sciences. Because of the quality of man that he was, he received the, uh, the um, Medal of Honor recipient and he is featured along with the other heroes in the Hall of Honor in the Memorial Student Center. There's also a, um, a display. This wonderful one over here on the right is in the Corps of Cadets building. And um, there's Whiteley Hall is a Corps of Cadets um, dorm. And then there's also Eli Whiteley Park. So he is well remembered. Do you know where the park is? Yes, it's hard to find. It's right as you're going underneath Welburn Road on University. It's right there as you pass underneath Welburn. You look to the left and it's there. You don't see it very much. Uh, I, had to, I had to go all the way and park all over the place trying to get that picture of the park. Yeah. Um, the, other, the next thing I was trying to do was um, find out a little bit about some of the people involved with the music department at A&M. And Colonel Dunn was an extremely talented musician. He was in the Army, and he became one of the youngest members to be a U.S. Army bandmaster. 
So when he came to A&M in 1924, that was, I think, a, a real coup for A&M to get this man to be the leader of our band. Now, I was amazed because when I was growing up, I always think of all these, these wonderful, huge band members doing all their practicing. That picture right there is about 1938, 1939. There were 122 members instead of 350 plus in the Aggie band. But I'll bet you they were dynamite marchers then, just like they are now. Um, the student up here in the um, left-hand corner of the Spirit of Aggieland music is Marvin Mims, and he is actually the one who wrote the lyrics to the Spirit of Aggieland. And he brought his lyrics to Colonel Dunn, and Colonel Dunn wrote the music in a matter of a day or two. So he was, he was really quite a brilliant musician and um, um, arranger. It, um, it mentioned that in 1924, he made the Aggie Band one of the best and largest bands in the South. And then one of his greatest honors was he was elected to the American Bandmasters Association and was only one of two members from the South to receive that honor. Uh, actually, when he retired from A&M, he also went on and he was the music director, choir and band and everything at A&M Consolidated for a while. So I bet they were excited to have somebody of that quality before Mr. Coulter came. <laughs> um, this man, uh, does anybody know who Bob Boone was? Is anybody uh, familiar with him? He has a special place in my heart because I will be celebrating my 55th wedding anniversary next week. And Bob Boone was the one who sang at my husband's and my wedding in 1966. So I had to put him in here, but he also deserves a place because he was the singing cadets director for 35 years. And he was also very involved with the choir and the music program at the um, Methodist Church. So this was the 1988 group. I don't know how many men are in the Singing Cadets now, but um, they've always made my heart proud every time I've ever heard them sing. Um, the next group I was trying to put together for you all is um, some of the athletic department coaches. There are four that we're going to talk about here briefly. Um, Art Adamson is the person who taught just about every kid in College Station, Texas, how to swim. And he... Um, he yes, he taught me how. Did he? Awesome, awesome. I won't ask you what year that was, but that's okay. <laughs> but he was uh, in the swimming program from 1938 to 1970. So he put out a lot of champion uh, swimmers. He also was the one who was behind the champion water polo teams. I had never seen water polo until I, I was visiting over there one time. So in 1935 and 1965, he had the National Water Polo Champions. So that's pretty good. He, um, oh, I know I was going to tell you the, the big swimming pool at Bee Creek Park. That is called Adamson Lagoon for Art Adamson in memory of him and, and all the things that he did um, for the kids of the community. This gentleman, I had no idea anything about Omar Smith until I started looking into him. And he is quite an interesting individual. He was an outstanding tennis coach. And the intramural courts um, are named after him at A&M right now. 1963 to 64, he had an Aggie tennis, tennis team that was ranked, ranked 10th in the nation. And that is quite something. But what I most want to point out about him that just thrilled me to pieces, I, I love Dairy Queen. <laughs> and he had the first Dairy Queen in College Station, but he also was the penultimate businessman because he was partner in another 40 DQs across the state of Texas. 
the thing that is most wonderful to me is that at some point, I'm not sure exactly what year it was, he told A&M that he would not take his salary and he insisted that all of his salary be given for scholarships to Texas A&M. So I think he must have been quite the man. I can't help but be a little partial when I look at this slide. <laughs> um, the gentleman on the far left, Manning Smith, is my father. And he came with Homer Norton from Centenary College. He was Norton's undefeated quarterback there, and Norton brought him with him when he came to A&M to be the football coach. The gentleman on the right is Marty Carreau, Coach Marty and Coach Smitty. Um, they were you know, both coaches for the 39 national champion football team. My dad was the youngest and actually the only one still living when they had their 50th reunion in 1989. Um, some of the things that are up here are that have to do with his football time. Um, the football over there belonged to Homer Norton at one point. So for the gentlemen in the room, they might get a kick out of that. Um, we also, I also have the original photograph with all of these coaches. Marty Carreau was actually from Ohio State University and he came here in about 1950. And no, I'm sorry, in 1950 is when he left, but he went back to his alma mater of Ohio State University he was an outstanding baseball coach there. They won some College World Series championships. But what impressed me the most is guess where he came back in his older years and guess where he's buried? In the College Station Cemetery. So you know that our town impressed him greatly for him to leave up there and come back to Texas. The ring that you're looking at is the ring that was given out to all of the 39 national championship football players or their family members if they were deceased. And this was in 1998. So my brother, I have one brother, he's Manning D. Smith and he currently owns this ring and I wanted you all to see it. This is really, really neat. He doesn't let it stray far from his side. <laughs> I tried to get it here and he, no, I don't think so. So those are for the, the coaches. Um, when I first got so involved with this cemetery project, um, I was wandering around and I came across the grave of Eddie Chu. And I was so thrilled to see that because I have such warm memories of him. He was the first bus driver that I ever had anything to do with. He spoiled my brother and I to pieces because he would, uh, the bus route at that point in time was right in front of my house in College Hills. And if my brother and I were standing out there, he'd honk the bus horn and we'd come racing out. So there's a lot of people that I have forgotten from the time that I was in the first grade at six years old, but he's not one of them. And so, I wanted to be sure and tell you about him because as I started looking into his life, I found out he was a tremendous human being. He worked for Texas A&M for 33 years and when he retired, he wasn't one of these people that wanted to go home and do nothing like me. No, no, I do history. I do history in cemeteries. But this gentleman, worked an additional bunch of years for the College Station ISD, but he was also very involved in his community. He was a deacon in St. Matthew's Church. He started the first Boy Scout troops in the Lincoln School. Um, he was an active Red Cross volunteer. He took the Red Cross course so that he could teach the other community members how to, you know, render emergency aid if they needed to do that. Um, he was um, born in College Station, and the thing that a lot of people may not know about him, which is really interesting every time I ever talk to an Aggie and tell them anything that's cool about the College Station cemeteries, he was the original owner 
of Reveille One. Reveille One was a puppy that belonged to the Chews. He got, uh, she, excuse me, got loose and some Aggies found the puppy on their way back to College Station from Navasota. And this is all documented in a uh, 1942 newspaper article. And um, he just thought, well, the Aggies love that puppy so much, I'm not gonna say anything. So it was many years later that it ever came out that he was the original owner of Reveille One. And then in 1944, when Reveille One died, Coach Homer Norton called Eddie Chu and said, would you like to be, oh, I'll get that down to your yard here. Would you like to come bury your dog? So I thought that was really, really cool. But um, you can see that he was a very community-minded, wonderful man. Um, I, I will tell you one other thing that I was so surprised about. When he worked at A&M, he was also not only the grounds maintenance person for Kyle Field, but he was the equipment manager. And when I was looking at the, um, there's a Texas A&M annual over there that was a reunion annual for the 39 team, and I was looking through there, and again, always looking for pictures to show you all, and there was his picture in there, so he has his own page, because let me tell you, nothing would have happened for that 39 team if Eddie Chu hadn't had their football equipment where it needed to be. So, um, I was also really impressed with, her name is Gussie Gertrude Peterson Wilborn. And it's amazing, um, I looked and searched everywhere trying to find a picture of her. And just le last week, I was going through the exhibit at Carnegie Library, the exhibit that was up for the, the um, yes, the, the 75th celebration of a and I, I mean of College Station, excuse me. And this uh, exhibit was up at the George Bush Library. So I finally found a picture of her, and that is her when she was young. She was the granddaughter of the Ned Peterson family who were early African Americans in Brazos County. And they were landowners, you know, they were really quite a nice family, and they had 13 children. So I, they were all very family oriented, and so it's, um, it stands to reason that she would possibly be the humanitarian that she was, but such a humanitarian, helping so many older people and taking in 50 children, helping them. Um, she definitely deserved the award that she was given in 1985 as Outstanding Woman of Brazos County. This is a gentleman, uh, Linda remembers him, uh, when we were in early on, <laughs> elementary school. I remember being at a bonfire and Pinky Downs was there and that's what he looked like, this little bitty guy and, and he just had a big voice and you never met a more avid fan of Texas A&M than this man. And I don't have time to tell you all the stories about him, but he was the one who came up with the Gigham sign for Texas A&M and his, uh, his legacy is really something. Um, one of the stories said he would like to, he would go somewhere like downtown Houston and he'd yell, Gay Maggie's! And wait to see how many people would respond. And you know, as he had established that, then all of a sudden he'd start hearing Aggies all over the place. Um, he was um, the class of 1906. What was surprising to me is I found his picture in an annual, and I'm going, wow, he was not just a, somebody that went to the Yale practices the night before bonfire. He was on the board of directors for several years, and when he, when he retired, A&M made him their official greeter. And then <laughs> I can imagine him going up and talking to everybody under the sun on the A&M campus, anybody that would listen to him. And um, 
1965, there was a Brian Eagle newspaper column that talked about him reporting 946,676 visitors recorded since he had been appointed 15 years prior. Um, oh, and one other thing is the, the natatorium on the Texas A&M campus where all the kids swim in the summertime is named for him. It was the P.L. Downs natatorium. So, um, there's... He would be at the pool. Oh, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> he was everywhere. He was all over that campus and uh, nobody was a stranger. What was his business? He was in banking. I read that he was in banking uh, for a number of years and quite outstanding in that career. He was appointed to go to Washington, D.C. or for some something or other, but he was, he, he looked like that, but he was a very intelligent man. <laughs> but most of all, he was totally, uh, totally dedicated to A&M. And I do have to tell you one more story that I read about because it was so, well, I guess it was funny. It was funny to me. Um, he was at a funeral of an, an Aggie who passed away, and the, um, the funeral director was asking if there was anybody else who wanted to say something about the deceased, and he said there was a little peace and quiet there for a minute, and then Pinky Downs got up and said, well, if nobody else wants to talk, what I could, I'd like to say something about Texas A&M. <laughs> So I'm sure he must have been a real character. These are two gentlemen that you may or may not know anything about. Um, I certainly did not. And this is, again, what's been so wonderful for me. It's been like a, I call it a, an information treasure hunt because I'm always finding out some wonderful things about wonderful people. Um, the gentleman on the right is Frederick W. Hensel, who was a landscape architecture professor for 35 years. And he has Hensel Park named after him, which is right there on South College, close to university. Um, he also helped a great deal with the landscaping of the College Station Cemetery. So there is a thank you um, there. Uh, is there anyone here that's in the A&M Garden Club? Well, I would like to say that, that they did a wonderful job. And the A&M Garden Club are the members who came. They uh, gave the antique lant lantern that hangs up there. And they also did a lot of beautification of the cemetery and planting trees between College Station and Bryan. But I found a picture that um, they had put in the little, there's a little small antique statue in Babyland, the first Babyland. That was from the AM Garden Club. The AM Garden Club is the one who put in the entrance fountain and planted all of the trees along the roads. And so we owe a great deal to the early AM Garden Club members, and I'd like to get you to come back. <laughs> um, the fellow on the left, um, here again, I searched everywhere trying to find pictures for these gentlemen. And you can tell that these are newspaper pictures, but that's all I could ever find for them. Um, Ellie Winder, I, I just couldn't get over him because I never had heard his name before. He was a sanitarian um, who was hired by A&M. He was in that position for 36 years. and he took it upon himself to really clean up College Station in as much of Brazos County as he could. Um, there was a real bad problem with malaria. And so um, there were lots and lots of small ponds all around the area, and he had an all-out war against the mosquito population. So he went around asking people to drain their ponds. And he was successful in that. And so uh, that was in the 1930s. And I wanted to give you a couple of these statistics because they are really uh, impressive. In 1941, there were 1,281 cases of malaria in Brazos County. In 1945, there were only 25 cases. 
and by 1955, the number was five. So this man really, really provided a huge service to not only College Station and A&M, but the whole of Brazos County. And in 1948, um, the A&M campus was given the highest rating in the state of Texas, and College Station, including the campus, was the first Texas city to receive an honor roll rating from the Public Health Service. So when I go by and I see Ellie Winder's tombstone, I tell him thank you every time because malaria was not cool. This is a gentleman named Fred Bryson Sr. who is a horticulture professor and a nationally recognized pecan expert. And um, they were another wonderful family that we knew. Uh, my brother was in the class with their uh, their son, Fred Bryson Jr., and they shared the same birthday. So the Brysons in the Smith family were well known to each other. But again, I never knew that he was actually an expert in growing pecans, and he was one of a few horticulturists that actually had an orchard. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm getting the, the sign. Okay, I've got to hurry. Um, I think it was called Dexter Park originally. Okay, is now uh, Bryson. Bryson Park. It was in 1987, it was dedicated there. Um, this lady is Mabel Claire Thomas. We have Thomas Park over in College Hills. And I remember her also as this wonderful silver haired lady um, who went to my church. And I come to find out when I'm looking into it, she was a member of the Parks and Recreation Board. Um, she was an active poet and an author and really quite an outstanding lady, but I remember listening to her stories on the radio. So I'm really old, aren't I? <laughs> this is recognized as the oldest park in College Station. That's, yes, yes. Oh, 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 no, no, come back, come back. I can't do that yet. I will be in trouble in heaven if I can't get back to that slide. That is my mother and father, Manning and Nita Smith. And I put them in here because if I didn't, my mom would be going from heaven like this. <laughs> but they really were a very unique couple and they are worth talking about. Dad came to A&M in 1934, as I mentioned, with Homer Norton. But then about 1946, not too long after I was born, he hung up his football shoes, his cleats, and his whistles and all of that, and exchanged them for the cowboy boots right over here. And he became a nationally known um, square dance caller for 10 years, which is kind of cool because if you stop and think he was a quarterback, he loved making plays for the team and stuff. Here, he was the quarterback of square dance, squares in square dancing. And um, he did uh, a um, record, I'll get it out in a minute. He did calls on this record for Columbia Records. Uh, it was a party series. And um, that's my brother and I back in 1948 when they first started into the square dancing. They ended up having at least 400 kids in Brazos County that they taught dancing to over a period of you know, three decades. Um, but they had to give up those classes and also the Aggie classes. Uh, some of us were in the Aggie dance classes. My dad was always trying to get the high school girls to come and be partners for the Aggies because there were no women at that point. But they um, eventually went from square dancing into round dancing. And I was just explaining that Round dancing, uh, the simplest version of round dancing is like Cotton-Eyed Joe with a couple, not a line. They're doing a specific set of steps to a specific piece of music and moving around and around. And so round dancing as it is today is much more complicated than that. It, it went from simple to very um, involved steps, tangos and all the different types of things, but they were nationally known round and square dance leaders. And for 30 years, they had the Manning Smith Conference at the MSC. 
and leaders would come in from all over the United States to learn how to teach ground dancing to their clubs back home. So every summer from the time I was eight years old until I was 18, um, I traveled, my brother and I both traveled with our family and we were so lucky, um, we got an education like no other. But I missed out on the natatorium and a bunch of stuff that happened here, which we'll hear about next week, or um, next month. But it, it was quite an interesting and educational time for my brother and I. We got to go to the Grand Canyon, we went to Niagara Falls, we went everywhere in between their teaching dates. Um, they were also choreographers for round dancing. They, they choreographed about 25 dances and three of them are on the, the all-time classics list. So that's what that is up there. Um, If you have time and you're interested, um, Anna was the one that said, bring a show and tell, and so I've got to do what Anna says, right? <laughs>